really good to be able to chat with you sitting here in my office in New Jersey. You're over there in Utah. And we've just, we've been getting a lot of questions. The two of us have gotten a lot of questions over the last couple of months and certainly in the last couple of weeks and days around virtual learning. It continues to, to grow in, in terms of interest. It grows in terms of its capability and people being able to consume it, that it's no longer that death by PowerPoint and sitting there and listening to somebody drone on for hours. There's a lot of cool stuff going on out there. And so I committed to putting together uh, the video, maybe an audio recording of the two of us chatting about it, getting some ideas because we haven't been together physically in, in a while on location right. anywhere. So this, this is kind of neat just to catch up anyway. But so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Certainly feel free to ask me some questions about virtual learning and, and what you're doing and what we're doing in this space and just get your off the cuff comments. This doesn't have to be overly formal. I think in today's day and age, people are looking for informal as much as anything. So the first question that I want, really wanted to be able to ask you is in today's current situation. So as we're looking at COVID-19, as this global pandemic, uh, we're right in the middle of this. What do you see as the benefit of virtual learning in times like this? Well, and so I, I think that's a really, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, because in a way, COVID-19, um, shelter in place, all of those types of things where people started working from home, um, shown a spotlight on uh, an, a need, for lack of a better term, or, and I don't know if it was a, it was a, capability or a technology um, gap or whatnot. I actually think it was more so a gap in uh, kind of people trying to find that type of content or find that type of work because they could do everything in person. And so they were just defaulting to that. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really interesting about that to me is we've been doing kind of what we would call these virtual instructor led development um, interventions, the wrong word, but right, like virtual instructor led development for years now with, um, with large kind of global clients that, that said, Hey, we want this, uh, before COVID-19 was, was even on anyone's radar. Right. And so, so I think, uh, it, it shone a light on a, on something that we've already been thinking about and kind of driving towards and, and sitting there and saying, well, if we were to do this development in a virtual environment for whatever reason, right? Like whether it's geographic constraints, whether it's travel budgets, whether it's disparate teams spread out across the globe that they wanted to connect and network and build relationships in a cohort, this virtual instructor led development has provided a very, very unique solution uh, that kind of gets at some of the typical challenges that you'd see in a virtual environment. And it answers those in a very, very compelling way. Absolutely. And, and the other thing that I think that ties into that, if there is a silver lining, and, I, and you always wanna balance this with the, 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 the stark reality of, this is, this is a really significant and trying time. Yeah. And, and so I don't wanna undermine that. Uh, and with that said, the silver lining potentially is that this has accelerated things that would have taken weeks, months, years in some companies to break through the bureaucracy of, we need to go to virtual learning. I think about the school systems and my kids right now, they're taking classes online. And it was, hey, this something might happen to, and I live in New Jersey, so certainly at the epicenter in the United States of, of COVID-19. But it was one of those situations where they said on Thursday, something may be happening, be ready next week. Right. And then on Friday, it's nope, you're home. And, yeah. and, and then it just happened. And fortunately in my kid's school system, grades five and up have a Chromebook and they are able to, to transfer to that. But that would have taken months of approvals and different sign-offs and government waivers to, to be able to continue to fund public schools and all these different types of things. And it just happened. 
And that's happening in yeah. things as bureaucratic as the school, but it's happening in organizations. And then for people in general, I mean, I think about watching the news or watching the late night shows or those type of things. Everybody is accepting of the fact that uh, we're doing this from home. It's the right thing to do. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. And then virtual learning is able to, to fit into a platform there. So it's well, a fascinating time. Yeah, and what's really interesting about that um, to me is that it's disruption, right? And normally when we talk about disruption and we talk about disruptive innovation and Clayton Christensen's great stuff from Innovator's Dilemma and Solution, but when we talk about disruption, it was a product or something that came into the market that necessitated we look at things in a different way. I think right now, this is creating a disruption um, not from a product standpoint, but from an, from an external, right, influences, impact that it's having on how we work, what we do, the ways that we're trying to, to learn from an education standpoint or a school standpoint, and to your point, a, a corporation standpoint. And so this disruption is building necessity and necessity is getting people to scramble and say, okay, well, so technology wise, what do we need to do? And in that disruption, shining light on actually what works and what doesn't work, right? And I'm sure you've had this same thing where you're watching your kids do this online thing and you go, oh, like that's not great. Whatever's happening, right? Mm -hmm. Like video in the living room with all this speaking of disruption, right? Like one kid trying to do their schoolwork and the other kid playing, practicing piano and having a virtual piano lesson and, and the kid not knowing that they've got an open mic. And so everyone in their class is now hearing some really, really excellent chopsticks, at least in my <laughs> house, right? But um, that is creating kind of insights and, and at least problems that then we can now go try and solve, right? Where we say, okay, how would we react to this? And like you were saying, things that would have taken weeks, months, maybe years, it's kind of a pressure cooker environment right now where we are sitting there really dedicating thought and, and time and resources to how do we make this experience better? And then how do we translate this into a corporate environment? And from a learning, a corporate learning and development standpoint, what, what challenges can we kind of head off at the past, so to speak, like meet them before they really come into play? And what things can we take advantage of and opportunities that we would not be able to do in a traditional kind of face-to-face -face environment that we are now able to do in this virtual instructor-led development environment, right? Absolutely. And then there, there are the two other things that I thought of that, that you prompted me. One's the goofy one and one's the more serious one. The goofy one, because I know you'd want that one first. The goofy one is the role reversal that's happening for me right now, because a lot oh, of times yeah. I do work at home. And so yeah. before I get on a call like this, I run around the house and I tell everybody, okay, for the next X period of time, do not make a sound. That's Nothing. Right. Don't get a drink of water. Don't walk across right. the floor. Don't make a sound. And Dog now I walk into my house and the opposite's happening yeah. where I'll say, I'll yell to one of my kids and they'll do in a hushed tone through their teeth, be quiet because they're on a virtual lesson. And so I'm having to adapt. They're having to adapt. So that, that one's kind of goofy on the, on the broader scale. One of the things that, that I'm seeing play out is in this particular global pandemic of COVID-19, in the past, when you talk about disruption, those things sometimes are isolated. They're isolated to an right. industry. They're isolated to a product type, even a natural disaster, which can have significant impact on a country or a region is still somewhat isolated. Yeah. What's truly unique about this is it's global. It's happening at the same time to everybody. There are no lines between countries or states or anything right now, even in terms of socio-demographic type of things it's hitting everybody and it's hitting everybody at the same time. And so we're watching people have to react and adjust to this disruption. And you're watching people watch best practice. So what right. worked here, great, let's replicate that. What's not working there, let's try to do a different type of thing. And you just watch country after country watching this wave react to how other ones did it. So it's, 
it's pretty really fascinating to watch in real time again in the context of this is this is a really trying time but in a time of crisis we can't miss the opportunity to take advantage of of the learnings and so I just wanted your perspective on that particular current event issue because I think that'll be helpful to to be able to share some reflections with people in the immediate term. Uh, but now I want to switch and think longer term in terms of, of moving forward and thinking about our virtual instructor led development process. So Jade, as we as we look at and talk about kind of this virtual development or in this virtual space, we've been working on um, and working with clients on what we would call virtual instructor-led development or VILDs for um, a few years now. So what kind of what prompted the, the VILD? What prompted kind of looking at it this way, going into this space? Um, what do you think? Well, I think that's a great question. And about five or six years ago, we backed our way into this um, out, of, out of necessity. And so we started looking at this VILD concept or, or VILT, some people call it virtual instructor-led training or virtual instructor-led training, or in this case, for what we really look at as virtual instructor-led development. I like, and you were the one that pushed on this notion of VILD because I think it's more connected to our brand. It's connected to what we're really trying to do. This right. isn't about training. I mean, this is really a deeper level than that. It's about, it's about development. And in that, you could use other things for D. You could talk about it. there's discussion. Sometimes we have debate. But ultimately, it's really about do something with this. So this, this learning, we want people to do. And so I love that you've really taken it to the next level around VILD. But in terms of where it really came from, five or six years ago, we were working with a major Australian mining company. And they were looking at rolling out a, a program around talent and they have so many people around the globe. And if you think about the vast expanse between their major locations and operations in Australia and the United States and in Canada and so on, to bring people together was a challenge just from a financial standpoint, let alone the disruption of the travel time to get from one of those places to the next was a really big deal. And so they asked us to come up with a virtual solution to approximate the highly rated classroom sessions that we were doing. And so we put that together five or six years ago and did that and worked really well, but then it sort of paused. And all of a sudden people were, now we have come out of the, the global economic uh, sort of recession and, and money and budgets had start to, started to grow again. And we were all of a sudden in a position where we were going off to a fancy castle in France, or we were doing this thing at a, a wine, place in Krakow, Poland, or some of these fascinating places that we were able to go to. And that just happened. And, and, and so it went dormant for about a year or two, I think. Yeah. And then a couple of years ago, I was uh, asked by one of the world's largest global pharmaceutical companies. And they, they reached out to me and said, we want to roll out training to our HR professionals around the world. And we want that HR outside in concept that you have. But here's what we want. We want to make sure that we get RBL expertise in the session, but budget wise, we can right now bring, we can't justify bringing everybody together and flying you as, as a thought leader or expert to all of the sessions that we want, because we want to hit a few hundred people, maybe over a thousand people over a short period of time. How could we do it? And it was in that room that we, I traced back to that, that concept that we did with a mining company a few years ago and said, here's what we can do. And the, the virtual instructor-led training, which has now evolved to VILD, the development piece, was really born in, in earnest. And so what we did is we said, here's what we want to be able to have. We want people to engage in discussion, not only with us, but with each other, and be able to build these global networks in meaningful ways. But we have a finite amount of time to do it. So that was the other variable in terms of the sessions. We can't have people together for more than two hours at a time and we really don't want it to be sort of a, a, as you think about your early years in college where there are 500 people in a lecture hall. Oh, yeah. We don't want that either. We want people to connect. And so there were these different criteria that were put in place where, where it then said this, here's how we can do it. So we'll get small groups of people together and, and we tested them out. We, we looked at about a dozen people. We went to 25 or 30 people, but ultimately landed in this, in this sweet spot of about 12, 16, 18 people in a session. 
So we, we figured this is the, here's the content, here's what we want, here's the setting at which we want right. to be able to do it. And we want them to engage with you. Now in a two hour session, to have a deep level of engagement with each other and with us as, as RBL experts, thought leaders, subject matter experts, all these weird phrases that people <laughs> throw our way, um, we needed to say, we need to move the content delivery piece out of the, the dialogue session itself. And so we started building out some really robust architecture to be able to deliver some of the, the basic concepts, have people consume those in the middle of the night, if that works for them, or at breakfast or on the train in, those kind of things. Do that outside so that our sessions can be really a dynamic piece. So anyway, we, we had this huge whiteboard in a room. We were laying all these types of things out. And so we did it and, and they were sold. They said, yes, this is what we need. This is so much better than, than sort of the traditional virtual learning stuff that we thought others, uh, we've seen others out there doing, we want to do something different. So the weird thing that happened, so we were all geeked up about this. This is really going to work. That same day, this was a session in the morning, in the afternoon, because of geography, I was going to visit another client and say, hello, we're going to be talking about some other type of thing. And so they could tell I was really excited and they, they knew I had a meeting that morning in a similar, in, in a close proximity. And they, they said, hey, dude, so what, what's the latest? What's the coolest things that you guys are seeing and doing right now? And I told them about this thing that we had just really laid out uh, two hours before. And they said, that sounds perfect. We want that too. And so I walked into a morning, into a day with a conversation about what could possibly be and walked away with two clients that were immediately sort of bought into this notion. And I said, and I think I came back and I called you. Um, I said, there is something out there. There's a demand out there for a different way of doing learning, engaging in learning and do it in a virtual concept. And I think we could really grow something pretty significant here to benefit yeah. clients around the world. So, and I, I might be putting you on the spot here, but like, because there were two examples back to back, right? Where you were sitting there literally in the same day talking to one company and kind of working it out, right? Like brainstorming and thinking and, and kind of throwing stuff out there to see how this conceptually could work as you start to think about it. Um, but then to have that like immediately trigger in the next company that you were with saying, oh no, that's exactly what we want too. If you were to think about like the two or three things for, for each of those clients that kind of said, Oh no, this is what we want. Right. What are those two or three things, right? What was it about kind of the, the virtual instructor led development or this kind of concept that you were thinking of and, and kind of brainstorming, what were the two or three things that made them grab, grab onto it and say, no, no, no that's exactly what we need. I, I think that's a really important question and one that we, well, let's figure it out. Let's talk it out right now. But I mean, the two or three things that, that really seemed to come up immediately for them were they were looking for a virtual solution. They were, they were looking for ways to be able to continue to grow and bring global groups together at, at a lower price point and, and potentially at a quicker time, uh, less time away from the role, that type of thing. So people were looking for a virtual solution for right. all of the reasons that people have been talking about the value of virtual for a while saving costs, saving time, those kind of things. Uh, so, so that was there, but what I think really mattered to them beyond, because there are lots of people that do virtual, but it was the level of engagement that we were going to have with people in this conversation. So it wasn't, let's hire a talking head and push information at them. And then it just goes into the atmosphere. They sit there passively right. listening to some guru and then they go away. This one offered an element of that because people do want the RBL research. They want our IP. They want the frameworks and tools and all those types of things that we have. And, and hopefully, knock on wood, they want us sometimes to be able to deliver that. But they, it's not always practical either from an expense standpoint to fly us in to a certain spot, even if we were to deliver content at one of their virtual telepresence centers. So... They wanted virtual, they wanted us, but I, the thing that I think ultimately really sold it for them is that intimacy piece, right? That we were, we were proposing a concept, a framework that was going to allow for intimacy in a virtual format, but 
by being really intentional about saying this audience size cannot be bigger than about 16 people. Because otherwise people can hide behind a screen name, they can click their camera off, they can uh, check and update their Facebook status. I mean, there's a lot of different things that, that people can do. And you can even do that in a classroom setting where people kind of stick their phone under the table and do the iPhone prayer as they're working on other stuff. But that, that intimacy piece, the connection to the learning and taking the lecture component out and moving some of that content outside so that we were talking about real ideas and concepts with each other, challenging each other, pressing each other in, in different ways to think about this. And then I could share examples from other companies. Um, uh, the, these are the things that, that really sold it for people. Yeah, and I, I think as I talk to clients or as, as we're talking about kind of what this can be, what's really funny to me is um, like, and you hear it a lot right now, especially um, as people are trying to go virtual more or, or need to go virtual more. Um, people say the word webinar a lot, right? Like webinar, mm -hmm. webinar, webinar. And it's always funny to me when someone says webinar or when someone else says webinar and then look at the reaction on their face. And um, I don't know, <laughs> I, I've got to be really careful here because I'm sure um, there's someone out there that does a really amazing webinar that is like engaging and funny. And I mean, maybe TED Talks in, in some rudimentary form fit that, but also they do that in 15 minutes, right? Well, um, but there is when, a time and place for webinars. There really okay. is. And the time and place for webinars is you want to communicate a consistent message to a large group of people in a short amount of time. Well, and oh, so in that yeah. format, that's great. It's information share. And sometimes it can be even training. Here's the steps to do these types sure. of things. And we want you to follow this process. It doesn't require a lot of dialogue and you can fancy up a webinar by adding yeah. polling questions and some other things, but it is webinar is a tool for a lot of people. And, yeah. and I think, and maybe where you're going before I jumped in on you is, is that um, a lot of people, when you say virtual, equate it to webinar, or sometimes they'll even take the thing that we're talking about, VILDs, and equate it to webinar, and it's not that. This is very different. Right. Well, and, and to that point, you said, hey, it's a great way to convey um, important information in a short period of time. I think, I think short is an operable word there for a webinar to be effective and valuable, right? It can't be 90 minutes of watching someone scroll through slides, uh, click, click, <laughs> click. And then here we're talking about, let me read you the, the novel that I wrote on each of these slides. Like it, it can't be that. Um, unfortunately, I think too often they are um, because when you, when you bring that up, when you talk about like a 90 minute webinar or a training done via webinar, and, and they pull it up and there's a hundred slides, a part of you dies inside, right? Like you just sit there and go, no. And so I think one of the challenges for clients have been, they wanted to go virtual, but there is an engagement piece. And, and what you said earlier, this intimacy and this conversation and this relationship piece that is not there if I'm one of 500 people anonymously online watching this 60 minute webinar recording, right? And so how do we, how do we get that to a place where we say, and I think really this is one of the most, this is the impetus or one of the most important things that kind of started off the, the methodology or the approach to the virtual instructor led development that we have right now is not you're going to sit and watch someone click through slides for 90 minutes. It's how do we have a conversation? How do we come together in a small group of people so that you can't hide, so that you can't just check out and, and do email or solitaire or whatever was happening on that other screen, right? Like, so that you are an anxiously engaged participant, right? Like you are in it and you are focused and it's not just that you're a consumer of content. It is that you are now an active participant in shaping the conversation and the outcomes that they're derived from that, right? And I think that's a really important piece 
is driving that engagement, not just so they'll listen and pay attention, but actually so they change the conversation. Because as they have inputs, as they have thoughts, as they have ideas, shoot, as they have um, insights that aren't just idea-based, but they're able to say, well, you know what? I just had a conversation with so-and-so that is the leader of XYZ business within the organization. And this is how they see it show up every single day in their shop. And then all of a sudden we have a new data point that is based on how we work here in this organization. It is not just customized by slapping an, a logo on the slide deck. It is customized because it is the experience, the culture, and the way that you work in your organization, the client organization, which is going to be different from every other organization that we're with. So that engagement and interaction shapes that dynamic. And I think that's important. Absolutely. And, and it, it, it leads me into my next question that I was going yeah. to ask of you. And that is, so how is the RBL VIL, VILD approach different than other virtual offerings out there on the market? So <laughs> this gets really interesting because when you ask, how is RBL's VILD approach different? I'm about to say a word and I'm going to say this word and everyone's going to go, everyone does that. But the word is like, and I'm not going to say this is the only element. This is an element of it, right? This is one important key and it's pre-work. And then you'll go, everyone right now listening or watching or, or reading just said they're like their eyes rolled into the back of their head and they're like, everybody does pre-work. Everybody right? does pre-work and everybody hates pre-work. Yeah, as exactly. a participant. And so the question then becomes, well, what if we were actually really deliberate and targeted in the pre-work? And, and so it's not off the shelf. It's not the article that you read about X, Y, Z change or um, development or whatever, right? What if it was based on inputs from the client organization saying, Hey, here's what we're dealing with right now. Here's something that we are struggling with. Here's the new strategy, our new direction of growth as an organization. Um, we've been getting really deliberate in our customer value proposition. What, what is it that we are proposing to our customers of why they should buy from us, patronize, be a patron of us, right? Not patronize us. Like, don't do that. I mean, you can do it, but um, why are they a customer of our organization or why are they a patient, right? Um, getting really deliberately focused based on that information of saying, okay, here's, here's a concept. Here's an article, here's a video that, that we want you to watch that is directly tied to that input. And then, and I think this is, this is the most important piece, and this really derives from RBL, um, RBL's outside in approach. Uh, we are very much focused on development, uh, capability and skills and competencies of the individual leaders and employees in the organization being focused on and aligned to delivering that external customer expectation. How do we get leaders and employees in the organization to do the behaviors that will deliver on that desired external customer expectation, right? What is it that they want? And so how do we get that information? Well, so in the pre-work, you'd have a conversation with business leaders, right? Members of the organization that have a clear line of sight to strategy, direction of growth, and what our customers want from us. Um, maybe you have a conversation with a customer and you ask them, Shocker. why do you come to us? Why do you buy from us? Why are you someone who, like, what is that desired customer experience that you have when you interact with us, what are you wanting out of this transaction, this exchange, this relationship? Because we really want to push that to be a relationship between individual employees and customers and the behaviors that which they do, right? So pre-work saying, oh, hey, here's an article that we wrote on change. It might not be something that we wrote. It might not be um, something, but it's targeted to that client and their strategy 
outside in their customers and what they want. So the pre-work becomes much more impactful on the in-session conversations that they then have. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And, and it's, it's a really important piece. And I'm glad that you laid it out that way, because if you had just led with, well, we have great pre-work, right. bullet point one, and then move on to the next one. It, it is. I mean, everybody has pre-work. But one of the things that I talk with clients about oftentimes is whether it's pre-work or after action work or action learning projects or any of those types of things, I really hate just having them for the sake of activity. And right. There are some learning programs that, that are designed that just create work for people. Yeah. And, and then it just adds on to their already busy day. So what we're really trying to do is to your point, what are the challenges the organization's facing? This is stuff you have to work on already. Right. But let's, let's now offer you some advice and tools and insights to not only just from us at RBL, but from your peers that are sometimes sitting literally across the globe and talk about the same challenges that they're facing and, and how we can work through it together. So right. we're putting the work that they're already doing in the path intentionally so that we can help them do it better. So I think that's a really important piece. One of the other things that you said in this, Ben, I hope, sort of a winning strategy for why this is helpful. And that is there are a lot of consulting companies out there that make a lot of money by charging clients design fees, big, huge design fees. And, and this program, while it, it's not absent of design fees, I think it drastically reduces because one of the things I talk with clients about a lot of times is don't spend your money designing the content Let's design the, we will, and customize the, the design of the content. Let's customize the conversation. Yeah. And so if we get really clear about what your drivers are, let's not spend hours and hours and days writing up a unique case that then costs a lot of money to be able to get there. Let's talk about it live. Let's yeah. lay out in the pre-work, really good pre-work, as you've said, and let's lay out in the pre-work. Here's the concept that we want to cover, but in the session, will customize the discussion and right. have it be incredibly relevant. And so one of the things is, is they have to take a leap of faith with us sometimes because we're not going to script the whole conversation. We're going to script the intent and the hope of the conversation, yeah. but we have really deep immersive conversations about understanding the concepts of what's going on and applying those concepts. And I think that's a humongous differentiator I'm going to get a little bit geeky here, but there are a lot of people out there, a lot of learning today still in 2020 is built around pedagogical concepts. Yeah. And, and so, and, and in that, in the really sort of dorky way, and then we can get off the dorky piece, that's an instructor to an individual. That's a one-way dialogue. It's built on the old sort yeah. of university and high school and so on paradigm. What we've done with this was we were intentional and we are with most of our, almost all of our programs at RBL. We take an andragogical approach, which is truly based around adult. Did learning. you see my eyes right there? You could. I did. Right when you said andragogical, I was like, I can't yeah, I almost said even that. pronounce that. <laughs> but when you're thinking about andragogy, it's really about adult learning. Petty and then and that at, at its root is around kids, but but andragogy is about taking that adult learning, take it, harnessing the power of their experience, not ignoring it. Right. Because the people in the room or the people on the call on the session have far more years experience collectively than we do individually yeah. at delivering this. And so we, we bring that into the notion and into the discussion. And, and I think that's really powerful as you transfer from pre-work into then those live VILD sessions. Yeah, much more... Socratic method rather than just lecture, right? It's much more, what are the right questions to spur the right conversations, right? And having those conversations being key. Um, that gets into, in my mind, um, the second differentiator, right? So if the first differentiator is around really targeted pre-work from the outside in, right? Then the second differentiator is going to be the in the live sessions, right? Like in the session where it's, RBL consultant led, um, which I think is important. I think it's important to realize that this is um, thought leadership and expertise based on research globally recognized 
also having the consultants that are doing that research, doing that kind of global work with companies around the world, being able to come in and say, here's how this shows up at XYZ organization. Here's how it shows up here. Here's what it looks like here. And being able to bring that experience and, and kind of depth and breadth of knowledge around the theory and the research that's really important. Absolutely. As a facilitator. Right. Because it just starts there, right? Because there and are then, some companies that will go out yeah. there and do that as a lecturer or as a right. presenter. And right. we're doing it as a facilitator of that discussion. It's the straw that stirs the drink, right? Like it's, it's getting that to come together. Because that first piece is so RBL consultant led, but then it's participant owned. And, and I would even say participant driven, right? So in that participant owned piece, it now is, okay, we're gonna get you into groups. I know 16 people on a call, but, but we're gonna have you in groups of three or four, right? You, it's really hard to hide <laughs> in a group of three or four. It's easy to hide in a group of 500, right? But in three or four, yeah. you're bringing in those conversations you had in that targeted pre-work and those things, those questions, the reflection that you were doing there, you're now bringing it into a conversation with three or four other people. And it's not three minutes, it's 15 minutes, it's 20 minutes of getting really, really deep into how does that show up here? What does it look like in our organization, given our challenges, given our customers, given the, our leadership in the organization, given our culture, this is what it looks like and this is how it plays out. There's a depth to that conversation that is much more impactful ultimately than just sitting as a passive consumer of slides. Absolutely. There's, a, there's an intimacy, intimacy squared element almost because earlier I talked about the notion of, of this format drives intimacy because we're intentional about having that, that 16 to 18 group of people. So there, there's that level of intimacy. But then we take that further and right. drive toward these breakout rooms where people can have those in-depth conversations separate from the larger group and be able to really dig in. And one of the things that I think is interesting, and I'd love your take on it, because somebody out there listening to this or reading about it may say, well, everybody in a live session and classroom session does table groups. How is this that sort of revolutionary RBL that, that all you're doing is a virtual table group discussion? Yeah. And I, I, fi I find it really different in this format. And I'd, I'd love your perspective on that because it just seems, this seems at a different level than even table group conversations in a classroom setting. Yeah. And, and so it's funny because I, I know this is going to sound right when it said, what differentiates you? And we're like, Hey, pre-work and breakout groups. And then they're like, <laughs> buy our stuff. Thanks Sherlock. Like every, everyone does that. And, but to your point, um, I can't tell you how many times when I'm, when I'm walking through kind of the, the session flow, um, with a prospective client or with a client that said, yes, we're doing this. What does it look like? Um, when I say then, then we'll have breakout groups and they're like, okay, great. How are you going to fill 90 minutes when there's only like three, three minute breakout groups? And, and uh, then I say, inevitably, oh, you, like you can't do anything in three minutes, right? Like you, you can't do anything in three minutes. You are skating on, on the surface at a very, very kind of high level um, in three minutes, we're gonna spend 15 to 20. And then their eyes like bug out of their head and, and everything, they're going, what is happening? So I think it's two things to really answer the question that you asked. We are giving time in the virtual session for them to go deep, right? It is not a three minute conversation. And we're teeing it up and saying, hey, you're gonna be with these other two or three people for the next 15 minutes. So like, get into it and get deep into it. And they do. I think the second aspect 
that allows them not just a function of time and really small breakout groups, right? Because that is different than when you're in a traditional kind of classroom setting and there's tables of six people and you say, all right, now talk about this. You've got three minutes, right? I mean, that happens all the time in the classroom right. setting. No, no, no. You're with two or three other people for 15 to 20 minutes. But the second differentiator is that targeted pre-work where they've had a conversation with a customer and they spent a half an hour or an hour talking to that customer about this very issue. And so you can actually get really deep because you not only have the time to do it, but you've done the legwork. You've done that work prior that helps absolutely inform, not off the top of your head, you've been reflecting on this, thinking about this, studying this out for the last couple of weeks. Now we're giving you time to really get into it together in that setting. And I think that alone is incredibly differentiating from the live session. Absolutely. You couldn't even describe that piece in three minutes. Oh so we gosh. can't do that. I, I can't describe <laughs> anything in three minutes, but so, thank you. And, and, and so in this scenario where we're doing these breakout rooms, I mean, it's not that we left the station of webinars. We've left the galaxy right. of webinars at that point. Right. I mean, this is a really different place. And I, and I find it funny because we haven't talked about this before, but having the same conversation with clients and they say, okay, so when you flip that script and say, now in this 90 minute session, you're going to take 20 minutes of that for a breakout conversation. That's a significant chunk. I mean, you're, you're walking to the edge of a third of the program is dedicated to one breakout one conversation. Session. Yeah. But the power of that, and that ties back to that notion of let's customize the conversation, not the content. I mean, not the, I mean, not the sort of the look and the feel of all of these different things. Right. Because that's really powerful. Now they come back and they share some of the key insights. And and in the virtual session, like you would in a in a classroom session, you don't want people to go through and say, well, here are my five things. And then the next table does my five things. And by the time you get around to the fourth or fifth group, there's nothing left to say. This has been different because it's really different and it's really personal because we spent a little bit more time on it in the conversation. And so that's a key differentiator. We've got the pre-work piece, which on its surface doesn't sound differentiated, but hopefully we described that that's the case. The second one is breakout rooms, which again, on its surface might not sound different, but it is really different. Yeah. And then if you had one more, what would it be? Our virtual offering is different than anything else you can buy on the market right now because we have what? So I think afterwards, again, this is something that you could do tied to a live session, but I have found that few do. Right now we do them in as part of our academies. Um, I try to do it as constructed in part of every kind of in-person academy learning academy that we do, but it, but it's different again, because the virtual instructor led development programs or sessions are so tightly aligned. Um, and so what is it that I'm talking about here? Post work, right? So, oh. so <laughs> In that there you go with work. your next revolutionary thing, right? pre-work, breakout rooms, and post-work. Right? How so are you selling this? <laughs> let's say, let's say the virtual session was around career development, right? One of the things that we love to talk about career development stages, I say we, I love to talk about it. Uh, career development stages and, and how we help organizations, leaders um, in businesses, but also kind of leaders in HR, shift the framing of the organization to think about long-term career growth and development for their employees. Um, we won't digress on it. There's a ton of research and data out there that, that is a compelling case for long-term growth and development for our employees, that they're leaving organizations now more so than ever before because of lack of career growth and development opportunities. Sure, bosses are still jerks and we still leave our bosses, not all bosses, your boss is fine. Um, all of that still happens, but more and more we're leaving because lack of career growth and development opportunities, right? So let's say we had a virtual instructor-led development session on how do we have career conversations? How do we help people grow in their career? How do we look at stages of development? We did that. We had the virtual session. Coming out of that, 
the invitation to each participant is then, all right, one, you need to do some self-reflection, okay? Your direct reports, where do you think they are in their careers? And where do you think they wanna go? You do some homework, you do some research, you do some data gathering, right? And by research, I mean, you're, you're thinking about them, reflecting on them, conversations you've had in the past. And then the ask is really, now go have a career development conversation with that person. And then you like using all of the stuff that we talked about in the virtual session, the conversations, the inputs that you got in your breakout conversations with the other members in your organization of what we do well here and what we don't necessarily do well here. You're taking all of that into that conversation. And then afterwards, you're doing an after action review. You're asking yourself three questions. Shoot, I would even recommend you ask your direct report these three questions. Saying, I'm trying to work on this. I'm trying to help people grow in their careers. We did a, a session, um, the best session I've ever been in. That's what they're gonna say, it's fine. Um, and I wanna work on this. So here are three questions. What went well in that conversation? What didn't go well in that conversation? And the most important question of the three, what am I going to do different next time? Or if you're having that with your direct report, what should I do different next time? And as they continually put into practice relatively sh soon after the session, but not just implement or act on that post work, it's really the reflection. It is that constant after action review reflection where you're saying what went well, what didn't go well, and what am I going to do different next time? And then they do that. They tweak it. They make minor adjustments and changes to the next time. And then after that next time, they ask the three questions again and again and again. It is vital. This is why instructor led, right? RBL consultant led but participant owned, right? They own this growth and development. And that self-reflection is something that we, we do not spend nearly enough time doing in today's day and age. They get that, the more they do it, that's how we grow and develop. So I think those are the differentiators. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that I'm reflecting on is, as you're saying that is in a traditional classroom setting, day-long event, multi-day event, you may cover those things. There may be one of those tools. And by the way, yeah. this, this segment that we just did, um, we hope after the session sometime you have time to go and do this thing and ask these three questions of your direct report. Oh, and by the way, after the break, we're going to come back and do another model. And then that'll then have a new assignment and all of these things play out. And so they just fall on top of each other when we try to maximize the fact that we have everybody together. So let's give them as much content as we can right. in that short amount of time. And in this, what we're doing is taking very intentional bite-sized components and saying, here's the thing. And you spent an hour or so in, in pre-work. And then we spent 90 minutes to get to that together, talking about the application of that and sharing some ideas and, and some and so on. And then after the session, we're asking you to take some more time, 30 minutes, go and apply this. So that in two weeks or three weeks or however many, how long you set it out, we'll cover the next segment in a VILD. And it'll be a chance to have that cadence of accountability. This thing really breaks itself up because you don't feel that pressure to get them everything yes. because we're here physically. And so it, it's that combined with all of the other things creates a real sense of differentiation in RBL's VILD. Yeah, very targeted, right? And I, and I think that is a very important word here. These, each pre-work, session and post work is deliberate it is targeted and it is aligned to that bigger picture but it is in a small enough burst that we actually don't feel overwhelmed we feel like we can do it and we can have that conversation we can have that self-reflection um, because we're not like drinking from the fire hose right and so i think that is a key piece so how do we how do we engage people in a virtual environment how do we get people engaged in this learning. So what, what kind of tips, what suggestions, what things have you seen that are effective in engaging virtual learners? I think one of the first things that, that you have to deal with is people have their own preconceived notion of what virtual learning is. It's that, oh boy, here comes the webinar and I'm going to have to sit here and listen to somebody drone on for a long time. And, and so you have a mental hurdle 
that you have to get through for many people, individuals, clients, whoever, as you think about these virtual learning sessions. So the way to break that hurdle really quickly is to engage them in, in I think, a few key ways. One is camera on. In yeah. today's technology and the platforms that we have, they have been pretty efficient in their use of bandwidth. And, and so whichever platform you use, and I won't call them out and give anybody a free commercial here, but the bandwidth allows for video. And so having these sessions, especially when we talk about for VA, effective VILDs, have them be small groups, click that camera on and, and you'll get used to it. And, and you've got the, the mess on my shelf behind me or those kind of things, but it also creates a level of personalization. And so clicking that video on again, drives toward this intimacy that being on a teleconference or a webinar just doesn't allow to happen. And so that, that's one way. Second piece, a lot of these technology platforms today have a number of bells and whistles available to you. So use the polls, for example, use the polling functionality. And it's, it's sort of like with, when you're putting together any type of recipe, if, if you put, and you have your list of ingredients, if you put too much of something in, it dominates. And so you don't want to just do a poll every minute and a half for the sake of, because the technology's there, don't get stupid with it. But use those as a way to quickly gather information from people and to get a sense of where they stand and, and then be able to move on. Another tool that's in there are whiteboards. There are times where you may have a key concept or a framework up and, and you want people to, to give their uh, point of view on it and they can type in on a whiteboard or they can point an arrow to the thing that they think is most important if you have four quadrants of something uh, or direction of growth as they start thinking about where are we going as a company? Are we going from here as a quality organization to innovation is our most important thing? As we start thinking about the different options, whiteboard's a key tool. Chat, chat's an incredibly underutilized tool. Chat is tricky for the facilitator right. because you're trying to sort of deliver a message and see with people's faces where they're engaged. And so reading the chat is, is a little bit complicated. Chat's not for you and me, yeah. chat's for them. Right. And so their ability to connect with each other and there's a concept coming out and I've watched a number of different clients and particip participants put in the chat, hey, I've got a slide deck on such and such thing that really touches on this. Here's the link to it or send me an email and, and, and I'll send it to you. And so it's a really important, powerful tool to, to drive engagement. Don't discourage people being distracted by the chat. That's actually a way to engage them and connect. And those breakout rooms, the virtual breakout rooms where you can take your group of 16, 18 people and split them out through a, literally a touch of a button with today's technology platforms. Just say, how many breakout rooms do you want? Click the button and boom, it happens. You can also manually set them up if you want to be intentional about how you mix groups. But um, the, the breakout rooms are a tremendous tool to be able to drive engagement. And then finally, and probably the most important piece is make this a dialogue, not a monologue. And I know that's sort of an old sort of adage that, that we've all been taught for years in a classroom setting, but it matters even more in a virtual setting because people, you're compressing the time, you're using a technology that doesn't have you in that physical space. And so your ability to escape can happen. So engage them in that dialogue. And that's a critical way to help drive engagement and interaction in virtual programs.